cockerel sounds its familiar morning wake-up call as the first shards of sunlight spill out from a distant mountain, dappling the silhouetted sleepy landscape. Swathes of lush green forest bristle with tall trees and thick sticks of bamboo. It might not look like it, but this is the fourth most heavily populated place on Earth, Java. One of thousands of volcanic islands that together form the Southeast Asian nation of Indonesia. Here on the west of the island, in the shadow of one of those volcanoes, lives a special creature struggling for survival in the face of countless threats. The slow loris. A slow loris is a small primate. It's related to monkeys and apes. It only comes out at night, it's nocturnal. And it lives throughout Asia, so it lives all the way from Northeast India to the Philippines. The slow loris is a special primate because it has a number of characteristics that make it unique from other monkeys and lemurs. It can't jump, so it has a really tiny tail. It's very strong, so it could hold on to trees and branches for hours on end. Its diet is extremely specialized. It could eat toxic things and unpalatable things like tree gums. It could go into hibernation and it's venomous. My name's Carrie Hope Fletcher and I want to talk to you about these amazing animals and why we must work together to save them from extinction. For the last five years, conservationists from the Little Fireface Project have been trekking from their research base in the village of Chipiganti into the heart of the Papadayan forest to spend long nights observing these fascinating animals to try and better understand their behaviour. As the only venomous primate in the world, a key area of investigation has been to try and understand why they carry their deadly toxin. Lorises are extremely territorial. They live in a single male, single female group. So females fight with females, males fight with males, and when the young ones leave home, they fight with rivals to get new areas. And the venom is very important at this time. It's so horrible if a loris gets bitten by another loris that in rescue centers or zoos, it's one of the number one causes of death. But in the wild, a loris can somehow survive a loris bite, even though it may be scarred for life. Rare and nimble-footed, there is only one way to spot this nocturnal tree wanderer. The loris's huge eyes enable them to see in almost total darkness. But when humans enter their world with big bright lights, they can really disturb them. Their pupils shrink, they struggle to see, and they are unable to carry out normal behaviours. Instead, Trackers use red light to pick out the loris amidst the sea of black. Lorises are monochromats. They can only see in black and white and they cannot see red. And so when we watch them with a red light, they just see a dull glow and they tend to be habituated much more quickly. They can behave much more naturally and it doesn't cause pain to the animals. To help scientists find these elusive clandestine creatures, they attach small, unobtrusive radio collars to them. Using a large antenna, knowledgeable local trekkers can search for a radio frequency being emitted from the collar to get a rough idea of the loris's location. From time to time, the collars need to be changed and scientists use this opportunity to take valuable measurements at close quarters. Working together, trackers skillfully isolate a loris to an unconnected tree and after a quick shimmy up the trunk, an outstretched hand gently reaches out for the animal. A silk bag is used to provide a dark, calming environment for the loris as it is rapidly transferred to the team of waiting scientists. The existing collar is removed and replaced, as is the small gauge which provides skin temperature data. A series of measurements are also taken, as well as faecal and hair samples. Finally, the weight is recorded before the animal is returned safely to the wild. We try our best to make sure the lorises aren't stressed, so everyone's very cautious and uh, sometimes you have to wait an hour or two to get the loris because they could be hiding in the bamboo, they could be up a slippery tree, so for safety we always make sure they're in a good spot. 
There is still much to learn about these fascinating animals, but we do know that they are in danger. In the last two decades, their numbers have plummeted and are now at a critical level. As the population of Indonesia continues to grow, the tree line recedes further up the mountainside, destroying precious habitats to make way for farming. Uh, ayah, Sekitar 20 tahunan lah lebih ya. Di tanaman saya menanam kentang, status, terus uh, uh, walu, wortel, wortel, kol, uh, sampo, dan macam-macam lah. Banyak yang dibuka olahan pertanian. Tanahnya subur, kalau di, kalau di bawah kan uh, ininya kurang kalau itu cocoknya untuk pertanian harusnya di tempat di atas ketinggian 1300 1700 ketinggian Once the crops have been picked a stream of heavily laden motorbikes then complete the precarious journey down the steep rutted mountain path to the village There the precious cargo is weighed before a bevy of small but disproportionately strong locals transfer the giant sacks back onto the trucks and waiting motorbikes. Finally, the carrots and other vegetables are prepared for market, individually washed and sorted in an attempt to fetch the best price for them. But while the cultivation of these crops provides a livelihood for millions of Indonesians, the deforestation process required to create the fertile land has taken its toll on the local loris population. In terms of agricultural expansion, you're finding many populations being forced to uh, relocate at higher altitudes, where it's a completely different environment and a lot of the nutrients are different, you know, habitat structure is different. Even if you go to somewhere like Jakarta or Bandung that's quite close by, they know very little about the forest and there's very little forest left here in general anyway. So it's very hard to get people to appreciate a thing that they don't, they've never really had an opportunity to appreciate before. For the farmers whose main source of in income is farming, lorises actually pollinate the trees and they eat insects, so they help the farmers in getting a better yield. So lorises are important for the community, not just for that sense of pride, but also for actually making money. Sometimes clearing trees is not to create farming land, but simply to acquire the raw materials. Strong and durable, bamboo is a valuable resource for local people, but the patches of tightly tangled trunks are also the perfect environment for slow lorises. Across Asia, intensive farming and industrial scale logging to produce products such as palm oil leave an even greater scar on the landscape. But loris numbers are also under threat from another problem. With their wide eyes and cute face, demand for these animals has increased rapidly. What's become apparent over the last few years is that lorises are critically endangered because of illegal wildlife trade. This trade comes in many forms. It's for traditional medicines, it's for photo props on tourist beaches where people take photos with captive animals, and it's for the pet trade. People see it online, they think that it's going to be a good pet, and they go out and buy one and find that it's completely unsuitable to be kept in a household. It's clear why people think this is cute, but once you learn about the slow loris, you can clearly see that he's sick and stressed. Everything about this video is wrong, even down to the food that he's eating, which could kill him. Social networking sites have introduced lorises to an audience that never knew they existed, so the demand for them as pets has increased so dramatically that species before which were considered just vulnerable are now critically endangered. It's our choice not to have lorises as a pet, and that's worldwide. That's not just a local problem, it's an international problem that we drive every time we like a video of a loris as a pet, every time we share 
a video of a loris eating a rice bowl. And every single one of us has a choice to not do that and instead to spread the message that these are amazing primates that should be left in the wild. There are areas where uh, it's believed that uh, it's really bad luck to have a loris in your house or to hurt a loris or the blood of a loris will kill your crops, all of this sort of stuff, in which case the lorises will be, for the large part, uh, left alone. But in most areas, they're just another com commodity. And, um, you know, they go for between 40 to $70 for one of the most critically endangered species in the world to see over 30 slow lorises in one market, in one country, is very, very worrying. And we don't actually know the absolute numbers of lorises that are left, we just know they are decreasing incredibly fast. And the biggest problem with that is that the original threats, the original reasons why those numbers are declining, are still there. The threats haven't been stopped. And that means that this rate of decline will continue until those threats actually do stop or until there are no lorises left. When they are not carrying out valuable research or analysing data at the base of Chippaganti, scientists spend their time trying to educate the local community about the rare and special animal they share their home with. Antarctica! Bagus, Antarctica! People didn't realize that they were special in having lorises and other small, weird and wonderful animals around them, like binturongs and Javan ferret badgers. And so by revealing to people that they were the stewards of these animals, we wanted to instill pride. So we go out to schools all around West Java and give talks there. Um, we also organize events and um, essentially fun things for people to learn about lorises without it being forced upon them. We've already seen that education and outreach works and that it makes a difference and that people start caring. We've seen this for example in YouTube comments where at first people were like, oh it's so cute, I want one. Now they're like, actually this is cruel and you should stop this. Project members are also working with the community to create a tree nursery at the local school where farmers can test out different tree varieties to find the best fit for their farm. So over the coming months and years, uh, we're hoping to uh, schedule many workshops here uh, in the nursery for farmers to learn uh, more efficient ways, more sustainable ways um, to grow their trees and incorporate them into their farming systems in a way that benefits them and the lorises. We're going to also have the children uh, learning all about agroforestry, all about planting, all about making compost, all about these sustainable methods that hopefully they will um, uh, carry on into their, into their adult lives. Also, when you incorporate the children and the local people in a project like this, it makes it all a little bit more tangible and also gives them the, the skills to carry it on uh, long after we're gone. When we were looking for a place to work with lorises, we were working with an ex-hunter and he was showing us his most popular hunting grounds and he brought us to this village where he'd been hunting lorises for the illegal trade for many years before and where he still knew people hunted. So we decided this was the perfect place to turn this around because it was very close to cities. It was also a very good place where hunters would want to go to bring lorises quickly to sell. So if we could save lorises there, we could use it as a model. Through hard work and dedication, there has been a shift in the way the local community now view the animals on their doorstep. Conservationists on the project ditch their raincoats and wellies to don giant fluffy loris costumes to lead a gaggle of excited youngsters to the annual Loris Pride Day Festival. Traditional games create a fun, lively atmosphere which has proved to be a great way of raising awareness of the project and understanding of slow lorises. Teams of boys and men work together to try and reach the summit of a greasy bamboo pole where a bounty of assorted sweets, drinks and toys is the prize. Meanwhile, women battle to be crowned the sack racing champion. The activities, which also include apple bobbing, frisbee throwing and a balloon bursting competition continue until the early afternoon. An old folk tale is performed by puppeteers and there is also music and dancing before attention turns to the grand finale of the Koo Kang Cup, Koo Kang being the local word for slow loris. The Koo Kang Cup, of course, can comprise many sports and when we started our project we had football alone but we realized this could exclude women 
and we wanted to bring women in because they are protectors of slow lorises just as much as the men. So now we have volleyball as well. Thanks to the determined efforts of Anna and her team, huge progress has been made in the battle to save the critically endangered Jarvan slow loris. Their dedicated research has enabled those working on the Little Fireface project to make groundbreaking discoveries which are helping them to gain a greater insight into not just the animals, but also to understanding their own evolution. I feel all animals deserve their place in the world and they're all important in their own way. Slow lorises are important because they're so unique, they're such a unique primate, there's so much we can learn about ourselves through studying them and our own evolutionary pathway. They're also so important for nature because they pollinate flowers and they eat insect pests and they have their own important role in the forest and they would be fine if we would leave them alone. Those in the field are doing all they can to save this special animal, but they can't do it by themselves. The destructive trade in Javan slow lyrises is ongoing. And there's so much science left for us to understand. Climate change research, future mitigations, conservation, and even understanding more about primate evolution. It is also a gateway to showing people the importance of nature and of conservation. So if we give up on one species, it will be very hard to save any species on the planet. They're extremely important in terms of Indonesian culture and in terms of their role in the ecosystem here in Indonesia. And we absolutely must save them. The Little Fireface Project is working tirelessly to save the loris. Please visit their website, noctorama.org, to find out how you can help and support them. But most importantly, please do not let these viral videos of these beautiful animals spread across the internet. They're wild animals, not pets.